to Faith Reformed Baptist Church. We are continuing our study in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8. Tonight we will be looking at verse number 17. Let's read this verse. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. That's all we're going to read tonight, but I would like to remind you of the things that we had last week and today. The thoughts that Paul is presenting here in the book of Romans is a progression. We learn one thing upon another thing that he might give us a foundation for assurance of our salvation. And he went on to say in the previous verses how that God has justified us, he has given us the spirit of consolation that is uh, more accurately the spirit of adoption <coughs> and that he has said that since we are children and uh, we are heirs he made the distinction last week of saying that we are the sons of God if we are led by the Spirit of God and I made the distinction that a son is not like a child that is uh, all sons can be considered children but not all children are sons and in the ancient world the sons did the inheriting. And so he made that progression so that we might hear the doctrine that we are going to be heirs of God and we shall inherit the kingdom of God and all these things that are part of our inheritance. And so last week, if we, if we remembered correctly, being a son is linked to being an heir. And we're all sons of God, whether we're men, women, children, if you're following the Spirit of God, if you're resting in Jesus Christ, you are a son of God, even though you're a woman, or a, or a girl, or a child. Because sons have an inheritance. And so with this in mind, I want to bring this doctrine to you. If children, then heirs. Now, I'm, a, I'm of an age where my parents are gone, they have died, and I receive an inheritance, and... It was a, I don't know how to describe it, a little meager, I suppose. It didn't, uh, it wasn't something that I looked forward to for years, saying, I can't wait to get a hold of my inheritance. <laughs> uh, like many people do, like the prodigal son, if you remembered. He was not the firstborn. He was uh, just having a portion not a real double portion like the firstborn was. But he wanted it right now. He looked forward to having it, and he went out and squandered it. Sometimes when we think of what an heir is all about, we have to you know, get an idea. Because in my life, I never really considered myself an heir. Uh, because I never really had an inheritance to look forward to. But this week, we are going to take a look at the inheritance that we have in God. And we should be anticipating the things that, that we are going to inherit as the heirs of God. And so, the things that I noticed that can be inherited in this world are things that are really important, like it may not be possessions, it may be houses, lands, you know, great estates, but one thing that can be inherited in the history of a human race are thrones, positions, powers, those type of privileges the divine right of kings to reign. And, uh, of course, in my family, we, we never had that problem of worrying about that. But this has produced a lot of drama over the ages, where a king may have multiple sons, and then they start looking at each other and saying, you know, if it weren't for you, I'd be king. And then they would have battles and kill each other over the inheritance, over the throne. Well, sometimes we think churches are a little bit like that, but by the grace of God, they're not. But when it comes to my personal family, I can only say that I never really did look forward to the day when I would open up my inheritance. But when it comes to being a child of God, there's a lot for us to look forward to. And even like the children of old that had wealthy families, while they're living under the roof of their father, living with their fathers, they had access to all the things that the father owns. And they were able to work with their family and see and, and handle the things that they would one day be responsible for and inherit. 
And so we can see that in olden times, and it's not so much now that I would inherit some type of great privilege of being an earl of, of some region or something like that, like the Jarvises, if you, I told you this before, the name Jarvis comes from England, but I don't think Jarvis has ever owned anything. I think we were the ones that lived on the property of other people, like serfs and, uh, you know, like the servants when you play these games where you had knights and you had these little guys with the pitchforks, the little characters. We were the guys with the pitchforks and other people were the knights. You know, they're the ones that owned everything. And so I, but in the olden days, if you were a son of a king or a son of a knight, you had this anticipation that one day you would be walking in the footsteps of your father and that all the things that he had earned, he passes it on to you. Nowadays, we have to worry about the things that are passed on to us, such as liabilities and debts, all the things that our parents wanted to have and couldn't afford them and charged them and had great big debts, and now they get to pass them on to their children so that they can pay off their parents' debts and so on. But when we come to our Heavenly Father, not even close. So if we are children, then we are heirs. Now, one thing about being an heir is that someone has to die for you to get something. I was not going to inherit anything from my father until both my mother and my father died. And like everything else, that's the normal way of doing things. When someone dies, they pass it on to their children, whatever they have. Now, some of the things that we need to remember is that you may say, well, I'm an heir of God. And the world may say, just my luck. I'm an heir of someone who never dies. When am I going to get anything? You know, when will God die that I can inherit anything? And of course, when we think about the plan of salvation and the way God put this on uh, and, and executed it in such grand style, such, you know, it's just marvelous in our eyes the way God achieved our salvation. And that God, who cannot die, came and died for sinners. It, it, sometimes we just have to concentrate and just think about how a holy God set his heart upon those who hated him to actually die for them so that they may inherit all that he was worthy to have. Because it says that we're heirs of God, but we're joint heirs with Christ. Jesus Christ is not just a son of God, the way we are described in this epistle as a son of God, because if you're a follower and being led by the Spirit, you're a son of God, but the Lord Jesus, He is the Spirit of the Lord Himself. He is the only begotten and is the heir of all things by virtue of being God. And being joint heirs with Christ, we have to come to grips with the concept that we are going to be elevated to such a stature that it causes me to give pause and say, I don't know if I should think so well of myself that my life should ever be so good. Because when I look back at my life, things have not always been good. My life is pretty good right now. I love my family, I have a job, everything goes well. But when I was a younger boy, things were not well. I was the one that people felt sorry for. And now I feel like I've come into my inheritance already. Like, I'm a little bit happier than I should be. I shouldn't feel this good. I, I feel bad about feeling good sometimes, that I shouldn't, I, I should feel guilty about feeling good and feeling happy. But when I think about the inheritance we're going to receive, sometimes I'm almost afraid to enjoy it that much. Like I should humble myself and say, don't get your hopes up. But this is not a good way to think. This is, I need to, I need to learn more about the anticipation of what God has prepared for all those that love Him. And we are going to inherit these great, wonderful things. Joint heirs with Christ. Now, when I hear that phrase, I, I try to think of it this way. What is Christ worthy of, and what is He going to receive? He's going to get it all. 
the Lord is going to receive all of this. You look around, this whole world, this whole universe, it shall be remade. New heaven and new earth and all the work that he's accomplished is going to be redone right. And all the sin that's in this world right now, for some reason, a reason that we cannot comprehend, it will make things even more, and here comes the word I want you to remember, it's going to be even more glorious than it had ever been conceived of if he had not done it this way. Some people say, why did the Lord allow sin? Surely, I, if I was God, I would not have done that. But our God did. And He, the Lord Jesus, the Creator, is going to be the inheritor of all these things. And it's going to be so good. And we have a union with Jesus Christ. And we are going to be a joint heir with Jesus Christ. We are the sons of God with an inheritance. We are the children of God with a true father. We have the spirit of adoption within us. And we can anticipate what our father has prepared for us. Now, in anticipation of our inheritance, many times I think about that prodigal son. How he begged for his inheritance, went off, and just squandered it. Now, if you've lived long enough, you'll have a section in your life that you'll look back on how you squandered something or some things or decades how that you have wasted something that should have been used for the glory of God and all you did was eat it up and just throw it away and so the prodigal son having come to his senses comes back to God we, in many ways, every one of us that comes to God, are like that son who lived a life before the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And everything that we've done was a, not only just a waste of time, but you know, it's more than a waste of time. It's a destruction of opportunities to glorify God and to serve God and to be a servant of God and to be a son of God. It is di diametrically opposed to the will of the Father. So, if you've come to Christ, you are like a prodigal son who has come home. Now, when it comes to a relationship with God, that relationship is going to flavor or going to color the type of inheritance, or shall we say, a view of your inheritance. You know, there's a popular phrase where you say everyone looks through their own glasses, their own rose-tinted glasses, or you view the world through your own, um, you know, way of looking at things, your own glasses. And so, if you look at God and you look at your inheritance in a certain way, then it can change, or shall we put it this way, it can keep you from appreciating and anticipating your inheritance the way you should. There are some people that, that have wealth, and you look at their children, and they say, one day, all my children are going to have what I have here, and they view them like little vultures waiting for them to die. You know, and they look at them like, hmm, do I have to give everything I have away? And, and then they have this idea that, I think I'll just spend it all right now. Or, you know, the idea of, uh, of saying, ugh. You know, they're just waiting for me to die. I'll fix them. I won't die. You know, I'll just hang on forever. I'll put myself on life you know, support, and I'll just be here until they, I'll wear them out. That's one way of looking at it. But on the other hand, there are those that say, I have an opportunity to give to my children something I never had. I can give them an opportunity to start their lives with a substance, with something with perhaps my training and my love, perhaps my understanding, perhaps my wisdom, and if I have enough, even my wealth and my substance. And they see an opportunity to let their love go beyond the grave, to let their love and kindness extend and to keep on loving even though they're not here. And so they view the inheritance they're passing on in a different way. 
And of course, you can view this from the children's point of view too. Oh, I can't wait to get my inheritance. The only thing keeping me from getting it is that my dad just won't die. <laughs> Somehow he just keeps hanging on. Or, like, I just wonder what it's going to be like. It's kind of a strange way of looking at it, isn't it? It's kind of almost morbid a little bit. But I don't think it's morbid. Not now. Sometimes I feel guilty about thinking, I wonder what I'm going to get. Of course, when, when it comes to my own inheritance, it's like, will it be, you know, $20? <laughs> will it be, or, or whatever the case may be. But when it comes to my own children, I don't know what I'm going to give them. I'm just, I'm, I'll give them all that I can. But this is what I want you to take away from this. Your attitude toward these worldly things may be changing and flavoring the way you are looking at God and the inheritance that we have. Sometimes we feel guilty about anticipating the inheritance. I want you to not feel that way. I want you to look forward to the inheritance that God has prepared for you. What do you think we are going to inherit from God? It's not as though He's going to die and give us His om almighty power. He's not going to die and give us His omniscience. He's not going to die and, and provide you with His throne. Even though, in Christ, we shall sit with Him in His throne. In Christ, all these things are given to us. But I want you to think about the inheritance. We will receive, as in olden days, as in the days of kings, entitlements. We will receive something that perhaps we've never received in this life. A good reputation. A good name. A name associated with the king, the creator. We will be associated with him. He's our father. We have his name. We are of his family. You know, sometimes being a member of a famous family has its perks, doesn't it? Have you ever heard someone say, uh, we're old money. Our family came across from the Mayflower. We lived up in this city. And they say, oh, are you of the Carnegie family? And are you this and that? He says, oh, yeah, we need a family like you in our country club or the yacht club. You know, whenever they hear my family, it's like, we could use another janitor, I suppose. You know, but the idea of inheriting a name that has an honor attached to it, such as the Creator. Sometimes I feel a little bit guilty about saying, I am receiving the same honor that Christ is receiving. But this is His doing, it's not mine. I don't choose that for myself. I don't choose. I want to be thought of as a king. That is not my choosing. This is the Lord's choosing. We shall reign with Christ. It is his choice to take a sinner, you and me, and through his death, give this to you, and you shall inherit. He that gave his only son, shall he withhold anything from you? Nothing. This is part of his thinking and the transition of from thought to thought to thought to help you become assured of your salvation. That God loves you so much, you are going to inherit heaven and earth, the kingdom come. Who shall inherit the earth? The meek, the mild, the pure in heart. All these people whom God has saved from their sin. What are we going to inherit? A good name, an entitlement, thrones, the position of being in the presence of God. We're going to have finally a good name. Not your name. We shall take upon ourselves the name of Christ. We have the name of God pressed upon our hearts. We will have an honorable history. Unlike the history of the human race, 
if you want to take a look at the history of the human race, just go to any history book and go through the chapters and you'll see outlined the wars, the calamities, the atrocities, all the things that men do to each other. But when we inherit the name of God and we are in Christ, we shall inherit all the works that Christ has done because we are in Him. And He is doing this through the people that He is saving. We are working the works of God because we love God and obey God. That's going to be our history. That'll be our legacy. That'll be part of what we inherit. An approved record. A, an eternal relationship. A relationship that'll last forever. Now, when it comes to looking at each other right now, what we see cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's why every one of us sitting here are going to receive not only everything around us that's going to be changed, God will come back from heaven, destroy everything with fire, purge it out, recreate it, heaven and earth, you get all that, but everything else, every, all these bodies will be changed and we will have a new body worthy of the heart that is now being made suitable for that incorruptible body. We are being made into the image of God and we, and we are being made like our firstborn brother. And we are going to inherit with our firstborn brother all the things that God has prepared for those that love him. And we will receive new bodies. We will receive bodies worthy of the souls that God is changing now. When I think of this inheritance, I think of the Old Testament promises that were all based upon this idea that Abraham was called out of the Ur of the Chaldees and how that he said, I'm going to take you to a land and this land is going to be yours. You walk around wherever you put your foot, that's what's going to be yours. And yet Stephen, before he was stoned, preached this. He didn't own any of it. Everywhere he put his foot, not one. He didn't own any of it because he was a pilgrim. But by faith, he believed God still. And all those that believe shall inherit this world. Inherit this land. It's a figure. But just as that was a figure, God delivered that physical land to those physical people. But as Paul points out, there is a spiritual Israel which will inherit this earth. All of it. God is going to give it to us in Christ. It's an inheritance. Now, there's a common thread about all the things that I've said about these things. We've talked about titles and honors and relationships. We've talked about achievements that you'll be given credit for. We've talked about receiving new bodies, about land and possessions, everything, the whole world, all given to us. But there's a common thread in all of it. And I want you to think about that a few minutes before we get there, because I want you to think about it. There is a pattern. When we receive the inheritance from our earthly parents, the pattern is this. This person gets a home. This person gets a car. This person gets stock. This person may get a library. What is it? The lawyers will all look at it and they'll put a value to it. There's a, there's a number of dollars associated with all of it. But when it comes to the things that we inherit from God, how do we evaluate it? How do we say to a child of God, what is of value? Is it going to be in gold? Is it going to be in size? Is it going to be in just reputation? And I want you to think about the value that God is giving to us. 
because the greatest inheritance that God has said that we would have would be himself. He himself is our great reward. We shall receive him. Being joint heirs with God, we inherit a relationship of God himself. Think about this. He created the angels. They are not in union with God the way the child of God is, the way a son of God is. Not the same. They're not going to know what it's like to have been a sinner saved by grace. They'll know the glory of God. They have a wonderful... And those that have fallen into sin, the demons, they'll know the glory of God and tremble at His justice and will be trophies of justice forever, displaying the brightness of His justice in hell. Now, I know that sounds awful to some people, but it isn't. It is God being just. And the angels themselves, who serve God because of His true holiness, they are looking at us and wondering what it's like to be a sinner saved by grace. They may know in their minds, and they may know, theoretically, and they may say, it must be wonderful, that that's all they have. They can only say, it must be great, but only the sinner saved by grace will know. We will be in that position of having been loved so much that God gave us all things because he loved sinners and had mercy upon us. Now, I want to read the next part of this verse because we're, we're just about ready now. In verse number 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now this sounds like a conditional statement. It sounds like if you suffer, you'll receive glory. But it's really not like that. It works like this. Since you are an heir of Christ, you will suffer because Christ suffered. Paul has been teaching us, as in Adam, you died. If we are in Christ, we died with him, we raised with him. And as Christ suffered, so must we suffer with him in the same way. Not that we're going to be crucified, but when the Lord came, the world hated him because he came from God and the world is sinful. He told them the truth and they don't want to hear the truth. And when we are in Christ and we become like Christ, the world will hate us for the same reason they hated him. And so as we become a member of Christ and we become in union with Christ, we partake of his sufferings. And when we partake of his sufferings, it says that if so be if we suffer, we may also glorify together. Now, that's the clue that I've given Remember, I, I ask you to think about this. What is the common thread of all the things that I've mentioned concerning the inheritance? When we looked at the worldly inheritance, the common thread is the dollar value of it. But the common thread that goes through all the things that we inherit, think of it. Think of one word. What's one word that can tie them all together? if we are glorified together. There is, in a sense, the Apostle Paul is saying, the glorification of the saint is, in his, is, is his inheritance. Now you may say, I'm going to be glorified. That sounds like you're going to be put up on a marquee and all the lights go around your name and everybody gets to see you up on the stage and everybody gets to do one of these for you. Oh, honor and glory to that person. That's not what I'm talking about. The glory that we speak of comes from God only. Only God is glorious. There's none good but God. 
but we shall be glorified with Christ because Christ has decided and has been moved in his heart to save sinners and to come and make us joint heirs. And with his glorification, he is going to allow us to be glorified with him. Now the word glory is an interesting word. It basically means to be honored. Honored. And in the Hebrew word, it means something in its root form, heavy and thick. And you say, well, I don't even know what that means. Think of it like this. You know what a frivolous thing is, right? Frivolity, trivial. Think of the opposite. Something that's really important. Something that's not frivolous. Something that's not lighthearted, but heavy-hearted. Something that's heavy and important. You've heard of the phrase, the tension was so thick you could cut it with a knife. Well, the tension and the importance of God and His holiness and His beauty is a very heavy, heavy, thick thing. It sits on the world of sin the way clouds sat upon Mount Sinai. The way the thunder and the rolling uh, lightning bolts around it and the people cringed and said, this is much more than we can handle. Moses, you go up and you speak with God. There is a holiness of God that is really, really heavy, but it is his glory. It is his beauty. And as we become saved from sin, we're only justified one time, but the spirit of God weans us away from the flesh and from the world. And as we begin to see the beauty of God, the thickness of it, the heaviness of it, starts going away from the thick clouds of wrath and judgment to the very heavy importance of the beauty of his person. And how the beauty of his person becomes the sweetness of our relationship because of what Christ has done for us. And so, what are we going to get? We get the glory of God. We inherit the beauty and glory and relationship, and we are in union with the one holy God. And we get to be with him in a way that no other creature has ever been with him. We have formerly been sinners who hated him, and now we love and embrace the beauty, the thickness and the heaviness, and we love the honor of who he is. And he has decided to exalt us, to bring us up, to let us sit with him in his throne, and I want you to, to, to do this. To anticipate this inheritance enables you to do something now that you'll never be able to do in heaven. And that is to live for his glory while we are yet in this sinful world. It was glorious that Christ suffered because he was good at the hands of sinful men. And we are now with an opportunity to suffer with Christ that we may be glorified together with him. It is a glorious thing. It is, I'm not, I'm not saying that suffering in and of itself is something that's going to give you the Shekinah glory. But suffering for righteousness sake Suffering for righteousness sake. And remember, there's only one that's good. Suffering for the sake of God. Suffering for his honor. Suffering because of who he is. Sticking up for him. Being on his side. Living your life making decisions based upon his smile. Based upon your loving relationship with him. And enduring the hardships that the world will heap upon you. This will not happen in heaven. And the, when the kingdom comes and we inherit it, 
and we are separated from the sinful nations, and we receive all this. There will be no sinners. There will be no whoremongers or leader, uh, cheaters or those that love to make a lie. All these things that are listed in the scriptures, they are not going to be there. There will be no suffering for righteousness sake. This is the only time that we can do it, folks. This is the time. This is the time that we have the special opportunity where Christ who suffered for us, we can now walk in his steps and endure the same suffering. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look forward to the inheritance and see the beauty of God and anticipate it. And when God asks, you say, well, how does he ask? Does he send you an email or does he speak to you? He'll ask in this way. An event will come up requiring you to decide what will you do. Will you live after the flesh or will you walk after the spirit? It's as simple as that. Will you walk after the spirit or will you walk after the flesh? To walk after the spirit will be a path that will look like you're suffering. But when it comes to the Christian, it's not so bad. It's not. It's like you may suffer in the eyes of the world, but you get the smile of God. You get the smile of the Creator, your friend, your husband. The Creator is there with you throughout the entire time, giving you the earnest of your inheritance, the foretaste of the glory divine, the walking in the Spirit of God, the opportunity to be in fellowship with God, walking in gratitude of Him dying for your sins, walking with the integrity of the God who made you. And then one day, all the sins will be purged. And all the opportunities that you've had will be set aside and they'll be judged. And then we will inherit all that God has accomplished for us. I look forward to that day. I can't, it's a good thing to look forward to. The inheritance. The inheritance. If you are children, then you are heirs. We're going to receive the same promise that was given to Abraham. See this land? It's all going to be yours. It is. All of this world. It's going to be made better. There's a big renovation plan. Everything is going to be purged. Made new. You will be made fit for the soul that God is saving. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for your grace.